Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Linda Billings, a consultant to NASA's Astrobiology Program, and I live and work in Sarasota, Florida, where I am right now. I'm a co-chair of this program, and my co-chair, Caitlin McShay, will be moderating tonight. She'll introduce herself to you in a minute. What we're going to discuss this evening is this. How will the media and their audiences respond to the discovery of evidence of extraterrestrial life? Will it be a madhouse? How long will it take for astrobiologists to prove that what they found is real? How might you respond to an announcement of the possible detection of extraterrestrial life? Who would you trust to tell you the truth? Our panel of experts for this program are Lisa Yazik, Professor of Science Fiction Studies at Georgia Tech, Andre Brock, Georgia Tech Professor and Leading Scholar of Black Cyberculture, and Tony Harris, Broadcast Journalist and Host of the History Channel's show, The Proof is Out There. This is going to be interesting. Caitlin, it's all yours. All right, well, I, I do want to thank Linda. I'm sure she's watching right now. So Linda and I uh, got in touch a couple of months ago to pull this together, and Linda did a lot of the uh, organizing on the back end. But I just want to point to Lisa, who did all of the organizing, yes. mostly, because, of course, Linda's in Florida, got her in the DC, I understand the day. So we can really put it all together. Um, so thank you all for coming. This should hopefully be a totally fun and inspired conversation. My name is Caitlin McShay. I work at the Santa Fe Institute, and I'm the director of the Interplanetary Project. I also manage a grant that is nationally science, the National Science Foundation funds that's on origins of life research. That might sound different than the search for aliens, but life detection and origins of life are deeply coupled. And so we're having this conversation in advance of the Astrobiology Science con con uh, Conversation Convention that's happening actually right here. Um, so I- Santa Fe, are you based here? Where are you based? I'm based in Santa Fe. Okay. I'm yes, well, thank you Atlanta for welcoming me. Well, I'm, happy I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I'm very happy to talk to the three of you because you all kind of represent really interesting steps of how individuals react to really important, like schismatic paradigm shifting news, like perhaps the discovery of aliens. So whether or not that's uh, through traditional journalism and how we get the, the, the people to trust us, the diaphanous overlord that is our internet and the, the artistic way that we sort of narratively yeah. deal with these, these big changes. And so that's who I am. I'm an alien zealot. I'm really happy to be here. And I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'm gonna ask you all, oh, am I failing? It's better. Sorry, I know that I'm loud, but this is better. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, that's never been a problem. But I'm going to turn it over to all of you because I have, um, I, I think that you would do a better job of introducing yourselves. And I'm particularly curious about what sort of uh, sect of, of global culture you guys represent and what you're hoping to find out of this conversation, how aliens matter to y'all's worlds. So I want to start with Lisa. Yes, yeah. good job today. I'd like to start with Lisa, if that's all right. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Again, I'm Lisa Yezik. I'm a Regents Professor of Science Fiction Studies here at Georgia Tech. And I'm really interested in science fiction. I really believe it's the way we talk to each other about our experiences um, and hopes and fears about science and technology in the future. And we can use it to talk to each other literally across centuries, continents, and cultures. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, most of my my work has been in uh, women's science fiction, science fiction um, by Black authors in particular, and then also uh, scientists' involvement with and in relations to science fiction. And so um, part of what I'm hoping to get out of this tonight um, is, is to learn more about how, how Tony and Andre see these kinds of ideas about alien life um, circulating throughout their parts of popular culture. I'm really interested. I've done a lot of work on the ways that uh, scientific ideas circulate from, or well, from popular culture to science to public policy, or perhaps in some other uh, way, but the way it moves through those discourses. So I'm excited to learn more about how they move through, through Twitter and uh, television as well. Oh, and I wanna learn from all of you tonight. I'm assuming a number of you out here are scientists or uh, science fiction people, or perhaps aliens yourselves. So we're looking forward to it. <laughs> no, purple. Oh, hush. Andre, you want to take it next? Sure. Good evening. Drink. Come on, now. Yeah, you can Come on, now. Yeah, you can listen to is this good, Marco? Okay, I, I can hear it. So, my name is Andre Brock. I'm a colleague of Lisa's in the uh, School of Literature, Media, and Communication here at Georgia Tech. Uh, and my area of study is Black folk on the internet. Uh, I've been doing it for about 20 years now. So, uh, from blogs to video games to social media, and now my my current focus and has been for a little while is Twitter, right? And I try to bring an understanding of blackness when there's no body present and the digital and virtual spaces that we call the internet. And I'm, I'm pretty good at it. I do all right. Nice. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I'll pass the mic to. We have our own mic on this side. Thank you. Uh, good people. How are you? 
<laughs> so, so my name is Tony Harris, and I host uh, the History Channel show. The proof is out there. Uh, Friday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern time, we've got a, a new set of shows that will be rolling out in June from the Skinwalker Ranch. Is anyone watch any of the content on the History Channel in this space? <laughs> anyone? Has anyone accidentally fallen on my show? The proof is out there. <laughs> so uh, I uh, come to this from a, a journalism background. So while the panelists may be interested in my perspective on this, I am keenly interested in, in how you approach your work, uh, because I think there is a there's a next level. I was just saying this to Caitlin. I think there's a next level for our show to reach. And a lot of what I'm interested in is, you know, your thoughts uh, on what we're doing on the TV side, how we can do it better, how we can be more engaging. I have a crazy Twitter feed with people who are... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay so, so you understand that but our show if you haven't seen it is one where we're, we're trying to approach this and is take a look at and analyze so we've got a uh, a great group of what we call experts, and they are in their particular disciplines of forensic analysis, whether it's audio, whether it's video, and and we've got, uh, gosh, physicists and, and a whole host of folks. Maybe uh, I'm trying to think if we've got anyone from Georgia Tech who's an expert on the show. Hello. <laughs> we do a little recruiting while I'm here. So just sort of take a look at these videos. So in essence, we're a clip show of, of, of what we find on the internet, what people send to us. But more and more, um, as Congress looks into this space, as NASA continues to look into this space, I think you all know that there are congressional hearings on this next week, right? Clearly, our show will be following up on that. When disclosure, the disclosure paper was released, I ended up doing two hours on that. Um, and so what we try to do is render a verdict on the videos that we get. Uh, sometimes it's inconclusive. Sometimes we, we call it in uh, our findings, um, you know, an alien because there's a technical de definition of what that is. And don't ask me to call it out to you right now. I know I, uh, Caitlin, um, but yeah, so it's, it's been a, a who to do and, the engagement of this audience has been more than, than I ever anticipated. I thought we would do 10 episodes of the show and then we move on. To Here we are now about to shoot uh, our third season. And at the end of the third season, we'll be up over 100 episodes of this show, which is insane. Um, particularly for someone who spent the better part of 30 some odd years uh, in, in the journalism space, straight up journalism space from CNN to Al Jazeera English in the Middle East covering the Arab Spring to, to find myself in this space is just a hoot. Uh, never anticipated it, but um, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to learn from you all in this panel um, as we try to make our show better and, and communicate this, this, this frontier to um, an audience that really seems to be into it. So I'm happy to be here. That's way too long, sorry. We're happy you're here. Um, so with that, I think, you know, there's sort of a timeline that I'm hoping to follow with this conversation. Of course, you're all here because we're sort of settling in the speculative space that alien life has been discovered. And what does that mean? But before we get there, I think it would be really interesting to reflect upon the way that aliens have been uh, represented across various forms of media in this sort of like pre-discovery phase. Um, theoretically, until we have uh, an example of astrobiology, everything aliens, if unconfirmed, is necessarily imaginative and speculative. And so I wonder how those representations kind of mediate our experience in the universe and allow us to understand ourselves. And um, I think that we have a lot of media to cover here. So I don't know who wants to take that first, but that's sort of my primary interest. I would like to know how representations of aliens pre-discovery in this moment, before we have them, the moment, that we're, in now, yeah. the moment yeah. that we're in now, before we get speculative, and then I say we're in that moment, um, how representations of aliens matter or factor to the way that we navigate the universe. Take it. I will. Well, I've talked about this before. Go watch the AMC James Cameron story of science fiction, and you'll hear me say, thank you. I thought it was really fun. I liked being on it. How many episodes were you in? All. <laughs> how, many, how many episodes did you Six. I'm in all of them. Just one season or just one? Just one. 
Yeah. It's a great series, though. Yeah. And, and they told me that me and Steven Spielberg were the two nicest people to work with. So, yeah. all right. So we were the only ones who actually like looked at the questions in advance, apparently. Yeah, right. So, um, but really, I, I, I mean, this really is like I think the science fiction question because right, this is where we get our ideas about aliens from are from science fiction, and especially I would say from media science fiction, and at least for the the you know I'd say um, the world community at large, most people I think get their science fiction. Uh, that way. Yeah. Some of you might be readers, though, but as we all know, right, science fiction, especially in film uh, and, and on television, maybe to a lesser extent, sort of has always had two ways of representing aliens, broadly speaking. They're either humanoid and they look a lot like us. And if they're lucky, they're on Star Trek and they have very attractive, um, you know, uh, make clear their humanoid similarities to us. Right. Or they are that very opposite thing to us, those social creatures that act with hive minds. They're bugs, bug eyed monsters, mm -hmm. literal bugs. For instance, starship troopers, right? Exactly. Sometimes like in the Andromeda strain, they're like small bugs, viruses, things like that. And so generally those are the two ways that we've seen those uh, aliens represented. And that comes out of the long history of colonization, right? Science fiction grows up in the 19, uh, 19th century modeled on the col colonization and discovery voyages to, uh, underta undertaken by people throughout the West. But really, people are modeling their early encounters with aliens on our encounters or on, on white people's encounters with other humans who didn't quite look like them necessarily, right? And so no wonder, and this is all during Darwinism, so no wonder it's either like human men, like in competition with bug-eyed monsters for scarce resources like water and women, think Flash Gordon here, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, or, uh, I don't forget what the other one was going to be that I was going to talk about. Oh, or, or else um, brave, strong, um, manly men, human men, are, are both attracted to and yet threatened by beautiful alien monsters who are just as sexy as human women, but have a lot more knowledge and technology than the men do. Right. And so you got to find a way to get those things under control. I think if any of you have ever seen um, Forbidden Planet, Alta, the scientist's daughter, she sort of is like that alien figure, right? Because she's not raised around humans, and so she acts like a man, which they all find very upsetting and titillating all at once. This is the 1950s, guys. Although the sex jokes in that movie are shocking, I have to say. All right. So anyways, I think that that's where most of our, our, our images come from. I do think now I'm the one going on forever, right? Yeah. French science fiction has been, I think, a little bit more... Um, creative with its representations of aliens. And I think that's in part because print, and to a certain extent, this is true of games and comics as well. They don't have to make the kind of money. They're not in the same economic sort of production system as movies. Movies and TV shows have to make back all the money that go into them. And so you go with what's safe and you tend to keep doing the same images over and over again and the ones that work, right? But Lisa, can I ask you, what, what is, so for someone like me who, you know, Oh, shit. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> For someone like me who grew up, you know, inner city Baltimore and this, that and the other and 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 the whole notion of of alien life comes to me from James T. Kirk. Ah, right. Yes. Right. Right. And so I'm I'm wondering, you know, uh, as as I sort of work through this show and I'm trying to understand and get and get better understanding of what I am to think of this world that I'm now inhabiting. Um. What am I to think about those those early images in in of men and women and how they're interacting and 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 what science fiction? It's it's the science that grounds us, right? And the right. fiction is forward casting or future casting, right? Not necessarily, I think it's actually the opposite, right? I mean, yeah, it's, I knew that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yes, good pivot there. I like it. If he's an experienced journalist, right? Um, but I think it's actually the exact opposite. We don't know what aliens are going to look like, right? So we extrapolate them off our own encounters with alien others in our own world, uh, whether that's with a racial other or a sexed or gendered other or, I don't know, a disciplinary other, I can say to you guys, right, as a science fiction scholar talking probably to a lot of scientists here. Um, and it's actually, it's those gendered and raced markers that anchor it in the real. Like, we don't know what alien life is going to look like. I mean, and, and profoundly so. Well, I'm going to stop there, then I've got Tony wowing. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good.
Andre, take it away. My contribution to this would be from the other side. So Lisa smartly mentions that uh, a lot of science fiction has placed certain bodies, certain uh, nations, certain religions as others, right? And I would add fantasy to that as well, right? Those of you familiar with Lord of the Rings are very much aware of how um, Tolkien viewed racial others, right? Or even the elves, right? Uh, for me, though, my work has, as I mentioned at, at the in, introductions, I've always been curious to see how Black folk are represented in these otherworldly narratives. I've been reading science fiction since I was a kid. I was raised, who was the guy who was doing the Mayan pyramids and the, the things from space? I can't remember. Gosh, I read, read him too, though. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. But maybe, you, maybe you are all of a certain age. There used to be this huge thing where they, they would look at these crop circles or these images in the Mayan mountains about how they had certain things, right? Uh, th and then from there... Uh, my upbringing also included large amounts of parliament and funkadelic. Hey, no, no, no. Hey, no. kind of space, right? Yeah. Where black folk envision themselves as being freed of these earthly bonds and being able to take both their style and their substance, the funk and the technology, out into space, right? And so for me, I've always been interested to understand um, what it means to be the other, the alien in Western society. Right. Uh, even as my body in many ways looks just like yours from the epidermis inside. Right. Uh, and so that has actually led me directly to my investigation. Of the because the Internet is also, if you think about it, a science fictional kind of place. I'm old enough to remember uh, where we just had labs or timeshares right, on computers. We did not all have personal computers. Right. Uh, and. Uh, I remember a time when answering machines were considered the height of technology yeah. right? <laughs> call waiting. Right. And so uh, understanding the ways that we are now able to invent, invest and produce ourselves in virtual spaces and online spaces, whether it's your children playing fork knife. And I know I mispronounced it on purpose. <laughs> right. <laughs> or it's you yourself arguing with your people of a certain age on Facebook. Right. We have taken these taken to these virtual spaces and brought ourselves to them. Yet and still black folk are not necessarily understood as appropriate users of these spaces. And so that part has always been fascinating to me because technically technologically, right? Those spaces should be equitable, not necessarily democratic, right? Because democratic is kind of a, a artifact of what, how Americans th think the world should be as opposed to how the world actually is. But spaces where we should have a flat hierarchy of representation. And yet still, for some reason, Black folks still find themselves at, at, a, at a divide, right? They're both uh, some of the most wildly inventive, highly stylistic, uh, deeply sought after tastemakers, and they're also considered the most rabble rousing mob culture, cancel culture people in the same space. And I'm like, well, why, why if we're in a virtual space, not even outer space, why do we still retain these, these types of things? And so I'll leave, I'll stop there because I don't have as much. And, and the only thing I would add to that. Uh, oh, you guys are on my is, is 1977. So the, yes, it was James T. Kirk and 1977. I was just graduating from high school. Yeah, I'm 62 years old, which means which means I was at the Baltimore Civic Center when George Clinton brought the mothership connection tour to Baltimore with the spaceship. Ship coming down. Yes, I, I, yes. That's all I have. That spaceship is in the Smithsonian Museum now. Is it really? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to find kind of artifacts and whatever else to place on the set, right? And I'll keep looking. Well, I want to stick with this notion of otherness because this is really exciting to me. I think when we think about how aliens are represented in fiction, um, and I just want to say, I think The Forbidden Planet is an excellent example, but I also want to say that that's actually an adaptation of Shakespeare's Tempest. So this is something that we've been dealing with forever. Yeah, it's like colonization. Colonization, visitation. Well, but who's colonization? Did they leave and colonize the mountain and now people it's are recolonizing the island? It's like, it's, it's questionable and it goes in both directions. No, no, a bunch of white guys kick a black woman off the island and take her and enslave her son. I think That's cigarettes. Right, but then, but then you, you could make the argument that Prospero is, is now like kind of the the island. Yeah, it's all, I'm just saying it goes. It, it's omnidirectional, um, but it's a question that we've been tampering with for a while. I really like this idea that maybe there's um, this sort of like Afrofuturistic dias diaspora that's looking to like maintain the otherness by going out there, bringing what's theirs that's unrecognized elsewhere. And so then I guess my question is, if we find a truly other other, how yes. does that change yes. the way that we understand ourselves? Do you, do you think we will? Absolutely. <laughs> For sure. Do you think we will find? That's right. On Mars. <laughs> I don't know. It depends on what we're looking for. Maybe we were looking for the wrong things the last time we sent those missions out there. Anyway, so that's my question. How does otherness change when an other other comes around and it becomes a little different than selective, elective, et cetera, an, express, an expression? 
Great. This is dead. We're going to have to just share the one. Great. I want to I want to redirect slightly though. Yeah. I'm going to bring you in this conversation as more than a moderator, if you don't mind. But how does your field understand otherness, right? Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, not only race, but including race and gender, right? But is, are microcellular organisms the type that exobiologists and astrobiologists want to don't want to study? Are they considered dramatically different from earthly organisms, right? Yeah. Okay, Andre, thank you for the setup. So um, I would say that the, the kind of sect that I fall into in terms of my interest in astrobiology is the agnostic sect. And so the mission that I was just recently referring to is the Viking missions and the Viking missions went to Mars looking for like habitability, water, or signs of life, DNA. But the idea that we're gonna find life that looks just like ours on planets that look nothing like ours is sort of preposterous and limited. And so I'm much more interested in the agnostic camp that's looking for sort of generalities across life because we expect that these weird places are gonna generate weird life that we couldn't possibly recognize. So I'm like really interested in the way that life does stuff as opposed to what it's made out of. And for me, just philosophically, my like hypothesis, and there's a group of people who are doing this formally, um, the, it seems that life makes interesting things out of stuff. And so if we had a way to sort of find that in the universe, I think we'd have a much better opportunity of finding life. And when we do, it will be extremely other to what we're used to because we're really an N of one. Even though we've got this a tremendous biodiversity across the planet, we're one biological example in the universe. So even if we do manage to find something through some lens, and for me, it's artistry, if we find some sort of thing that's making art out there, even though it's going to look so utterly bizarro different from us, necessarily, if it's life and we agree that it's life and we agree that we are life, then it's gonna to point to some commonality that I think will be extremely informative to like the big question, the why of being, the why are we here? So that's my sort of, so I would say extremely agnostic, even beyond cells, even beyond microorganisms, I'm talking like maybe crystal sand structures or just weird little dynamical processes and little caverns, who knows where. I'm always worried that Waylon Yutani will come in and we'll have to send Sigourney Weaver back out to conquer the aliens. Uh, so your question was the other other? Yeah, you... so what happens with like a with yeah. sand structure, if we all agree that there's sufficient yeah. evidence to call this sand structure life, how does that make um, the otherness within our own representations in the world different? How do we, how do we change? And if every a sort of unified human response to whatever evidence we find. And it seems to me that that... Today? 2022? I don't even think there's a unified response at this panel. No, no right. I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely you can... I mean, I was going to say that today to 2022, but anytime. Yeah. I mean, I think that human, humans are varied. And I mean, I mean, like, we're evolutionarily evolved to have different perceptions to a certain extent, right? I mean, there's overlap, but there's these differences as well. So um, first of all, I'm not sure it would unify us, right? Um, and if anything, right, I, I remember I was talking to someone here at Georgia Tech and I said, do you think we're going to find alien life soon? And he was like, yeah, five to 10 years in the thermal vents in, you know, one of the, like maybe Jupiter's or Saturn's satellites. And then he got this just dreamy and kind of yet evil look on his face and said, and it's going to mess up everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think is part of where, right, like you're like, oh, is this going to shift? our representations and it's like only if it shifts our minds, right? I think a lot of people, especially those of us um, who are conditioned on movies, until that alien comes down, looks you in the eye and shoots first and asks questions later, you're not gonna recognize it, right? Um, but there's been like alternate sets of science fiction stories that do imagine truly other aliens, right? Not just a racial or gendered other, but like there's been stories since the beginning about like gas giant aliens or, um, I'm trying to think of some very different ones, like cloud giants, electrical beings, all sorts of things that would be very different than ascension planets. Those have been hugely popular, especially since the Gaia theory, right, in the 60s. Um, so my favorite is Sherry Tepper's grass, where it's a planet full of sentient grass. I mean, that's amazing, right? And do you know Nick Wood's Azania? This is great. It's about Africans going to another planet, and the planet is sentient. It's trying to talk to them, but it can only talk to them by by triggering like a uh, physical uneasiness in them and an illness so they think that they're sick and going crazy at first and then they realize the planet's trying to talk to them and 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 and, and this is enough of a shift that they're then able to sort of coexist and go out and talk with the planet but they never figure out what they're saying to it solaris talk about a planet that you never know what you're talking about talking about right so we i think we do already have this tradition of thinking of sort of othered kinds of beings but 
Um, how and when that's going to affect? I don't know. I I just I don't think we're going to find consensus if, unless it shoots us. No, no, no I think <laughs> that's right. Mars attacks. You know, I just want to I just want to address one thing. Already, I think, and you brought this up earlier in your kind of history of of science fiction, is that and that's what the Viking missions were doing. It's like we tend to anthropomorphize our like search for the for the world, and so even if we recognize otherness in these like like the sentient water in Solaris, for instance, and Stanislaw Lem is brilliant. Like that was great, but yet we still imbue something like sentience when we're talking about life, and it's not clear to me that we're going to find sentient life first. Like, I, so I think the thing that we find, which is utterly other, 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 we have to strip as much of ourselves out of it in order to recognize it. And I think that, yeah, I'm not saying it's going to be this grand galvanizing event. I think that like there are, I mean, you can think about when heliocentrism was proven and then like we went to war with each other. Like this could be like a huge catastrophe. I'm optimistic, but I have to like prepare for the, but even still, it's like, even when we try to be as agnostic in our perspective, we can't help but see ourselves in everything we're looking for. And it's problematic. It's true. So just to add on to this topic of how different uh, nations or space, different countries would deal with an alien threat, I'm reminded of Derek Bell's Space Traders, right? Which is so US centric, right? They sent the entire African American population to space in return for these aliens' promises of unlimited uh, material wealth, cleaning up our uh, climate issues. And there was something else I can't remember, right? And that was the bargain that the white folk in the United States were like, well, we just going to have to let y'all go. See y'all later. Have a good trip. All right. But I always thought about it as there's another continent full of black people. What if the aliens had gone to first, right? And and how would that change things? And so my understanding of, of other and alien largely depends on the context in which you understand the alien is to originate from, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, to me, The Expanse, the recent TV series, right, is a really good example, even though they abandoned it towards the end of the, the last season, right? But that blue goo that was taking over people's bodies and creating hyperspace jump portals, whatever, that was truly alien to them the entire time. And yet they managed to overlay human political motives yeah. on top of it, right? And I see that uh, no matter what type of... Um, Sentience, if if that could be said, that will happen. We will still overlay our politics on top of it, which is a problem for me because I'm usually at the back end of that line. Hey, we're just saying, I'm sorry, Dad. Well, I mean, I almost feel like you're describing the limits of the creative community's imagination and its ability to imagine what that might look like, right? So if, if, if you've got the ooze, but then you're going to still do the overlay. Oh, sorry. And then, you know, that feels like we're not a failure of imagination to, to think about outside of the box and what that might actually mean. And I, 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 thought, I know you want to say something. I just want to jump in on that, though. One of the uh, philosophies I follow as I write is this uh, philosophy called Afro-pessimism. And Afro-pessimism moves from this idea called anti-Blackness, which states that the Black is incommensurable with Western civil society, right? Not, not that it can be seen or can be heard, but anything it says is unintelligible, right? And to me, that's really uh, a powerful formulation to understand what would happen if we did encounter an alien space, right? If you're, if they're so imagine, if their imaginations are so strong that they can completely wipe out an entire two thirds of the planet to say, okay, we don't see you, we don't hear you, you don't have any value, you can never create anything of value. What would we possibly do with something that we basically can't even build that ground on? Sorry. I don't think I have anything to add to that. Yeah. Oh, wait, I do, actually. Have any of you read Tade Thompson's Rosewater Trilogy? Oh, yeah, because this, I mean, first of all, it's literally, it, Tade Thompson is a Nigerian author living in Great Britain right now, and it's a marvelous story, and it, it the aliens did land in, in Nigeria instead of, actually, they go to London, and it's it's stupid, and it sucks, and then it doesn't work out, and they, uh, and then they're like, okay, and so they end up going to Africa. But Nenadio Korafor's Lagoon is also about that. And we're increasingly seeing that as, as authors from other countries imagining what it would be like if aliens landed on their turf, right, instead of on the United States' turf. And often in these stories, the United States is really marginalized in a lot of other ways as well. Um, so that's interesting. And maybe that's a place to look for other kinds of stories. And uh, well, although you're still not going to get out of the sentience thing. It's yeah, always about sentience. So, so what... As someone who's working in this space, I mean, how do I prepare an audience? Or how do I talk to an audience to broaden an audience's sense of what this might look like, right? How do, how do... Stanley G. Weinbaum's A Martian Odyssey from 1934, which has, it's really good. It's one of the first stories to imagine genuinely alien aliens, and they never figure them out. They're silicone-based. And the one alien is telling the humans, and he says, he looks at the humans, he says, two plus two equals four. And he looks at himself and says, and he's a bird, and he says, two plus two equals four. And then he points to them, and he says, two plus two equals nine. 
and they never figure out what's up with these silicon. They're just these little pyramids. They travel across Mars. They make more pyramids. No one knows why. They don't die. They don't do anything. They just hang out. But they're alive. They might have a purpose. No one knows. I want to try to address Tony's question, if I may. Um, I wonder, and I think a lot of us experience this with with all of the kind of like combative information, strange data, like deflections and uncertainty in COVID. Like, how do we behave? What do we do? We want authority, et cetera. And I find that quite often this otherness, this sort of like um, the unpeaceable element of us that considers that we might like not get along with whatever we find is obviously like a reflection of fear. And I think that there comes a fear. level when we find aliens. So I think one way that you could prepare your audience, and I think it would be excellent for science, and I think it would be excellent for artists, is to figure out a way to make the general public a little more comfortable with uncertainty. I don't know how to do that, but like, I know a lot of people who are trying to work on that. I don't know. But eventually, like, you know, I'm not saying that we can imagine a formal method for doing so, but if we could get used to comfortably seating in a space of uncertainty that doesn't demonstrate or like, you know, recoil or represent itself in some sort of a fearful reaction, then capable of trying to reconcile such a discovery or any other type of strange new change to the world. We need if to add meditative practices into right. science, right? Or, or just uh, separate uncertainty from precarity, right? Because yes. in many cases, if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you're going to be uncertain about possibilities for doing something dramatically different from those things that provide subsistence, right? And so that's always going to be an interesting problem to me. Yeah, and it seems that like something like invention and innovation is both the consequence of a limit and the consequence of total like richness. So like if you have, you know, if you have your next meal, then you have the space to sort of be creative and innovative. But if you don't, that limit also puts you in a, in a perspective to have to invent yourself out of that problem. Yeah, I feel like we're edging towards Elon Musk as a commentary right now. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid that. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> but yeah. the room can take us there if it chooses to, right? <laughs> What's our next question? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, in this, on this like theme of, of uncertainty, you know, I wonder how we feel comfortable reporting something like the finding of an alien species across the various audiences that we, you know, engage with or represent. Obviously, you know, if you get a, a paper from a scientist or an astrobiologist that feels like they found an alien, it will come with a lot of sort of like confidence intervals. And, you know, I say this is sufficient evidence, 80% maybe, that this particular thing might be the product of life, et cetera. So there's not, it's not hedging necessarily, but it's, a, it's an attempt to be as extremely, open. but that, that thing changes as it kind of mutates through the sort of media chain. And I wonder what y'all think is effective enough to say there's life in the universe. Well, well, so honestly, we're hedging on our show all the time. And, but um, at the moment that we feel as, as a show team, as a team of experts that we can make a call we do, right? But all I can tell you is that the audience that watches our show and a lot of the content in the space, they're believers. Um, and and at the moment that that we signal to them or they signal to us, <laughs> right? It's likely to come the other way. Um, that they've got a high degree of, of confidence in, in in their belief that what they're seeing is the other, is the alien. Uh, our audience um is going to drive this for us and they're going to push us um and we name the show the proof is out there for a reason and so it seems like your criterion is a sort of demonstrable element of the faith of, it, it, of this audience but but what i but we're going to and i'm going to push for this and and i'm i don't have to push hard for this but i'm going to to push for as we do with all of our our discussions about the the videos that we get is that we we want science to weigh in on this. We we've, I want that too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and 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 that's part of the reason why I'm happy to be here because I want I want to engage this community more than we have to this point. Even I mean, we've got scientists on the show, but I I, I want to know what this room feels and what it thinks uh, about how we tell these stories. Um, you know, when a half hour show that's 23 minutes with seven minutes of Amazon commercials. And so Andre, what about cyber culture? How do we like, how, how does the cyber version of our lives kind of it affect the way that this information gets disseminated and, and absorbed and transformed? So one of the arguments I made about a decade ago was that Twitter in particular, but the internet provides a space for ritual catharsis, right? Uh, and I said that about Twitter because Twitter at the time was only 140 characters. And 
or listen to one another, encourage the the publication, the authoring of things that were guaranteed to get engagement. We see the worst effects of that now, right? Uh, in part because the companies refuse to engage in, in content moderation. That's yeah. kind of way out the way, right? Um, the thing I do want to say though, is that for cyberspace, we're constantly asked by marketers to reimagine ourselves, not even aliens, right? To reimagine ourselves as avatars of productivity, of avatars of a certain beauty standard, right? Uh, or, so that we conversation before we got really attain, right? Yeah. Because we're always pushing that chase, right? And so to me, it, it's, it's an interesting question, right? Because I would argue that we, in many ways, we have alien cultures here on earth that have yet to be interrogated or understood, right? Or if they are approached in a, they are set up in such a way that they will forever be alien to us. And I'm thinking specifically of our last 20, so, 20 or so years since 9-11 and the way that Islam has been re, re, reconstructed as this completely foreign faith, even though it's part of the Judeo-Christian tradition, right? Uh, and so we, we've done lots of things to make those folks seem inscrutable and uncommunicative and incommensurable, right? And so yeah, uh, the internet, what the internet does offer, because I, I don't want to just talk about the positive though, so the internet does offer uh, possibilities to connect across space and time is super valuable, right? In part because it's really expensive to buy a home now. And so you're not necessarily going to be moving like you used to move in the, like 20 or 30, 10 years ago in Atlanta, right? Uh, as quickly as possible. But now you have this way where you can keep up with people or block people, right? That you no longer want to talk to, right? And I think that possibility for communication says a lot about how we would understand ourselves given a lack of uncertainty on how how well we can communicate with one another, right? I'm, I'm constantly struck by the inventive ways that teenagers and minority groups come up to transform the really dry communication of that, that the internet offers, right? So I don't know how many of you used Bitmoji. You look like a Bitmoji kind of audience, right? Or Emoji, right? Or even... Um, uh, different gestures, uh, uh, because I come from computer media, communi computer mediated communication. One of the early findings in the late nineties was that women use more punctuation than men do. Mm -hmm. right? And so I argue that we already do things to situate ourselves, to make ourselves visible to other groups that may perhaps perceive us as alien, but we do those more so because they make us feel good about ourselves. Does that make sense? And so the internet is one of those spaces. I think that serves as a vehicle for reaffirming humanity and really good and bad ways so that's really too much of the answer no no no. i think that's that's quite right and then what about like the way that art helps us reconcile with these things the way that art helps us reconcile these things with uncertainty for instance oh yeah well right i mean certainly science fiction can dramatize that although there's a ten there's that tension in science fiction because science fiction is it's grounded in a sort of completist and realist narrative. Like the idea is that you go into the story and you're estranged from things, right? You, you, in the best story, you're, the first sentence grabs you and you have no idea where you are. Uh, the door de deliquest, you know, it's like, I know what the is, I know what the door is. I have no idea what deliquest means. And, you know, um, but science fiction wants to alleviate your estrangement, right? To return you to cognition and give you a full explanation. And so in some ways, I think that this is potentially a limit, especially of science fiction and its more classic formulations, is it's always about the drive to know everything and to understand everything. It's a story in the way that sort of classic formulations of science were about sort of complete mastery over the universe. And especially if you go into the movies and you've paid $25 and all you want is to be entertained, right? I mean, yeah, there's a reason that people hated the end, like the third Matrix movie, right? Because it didn't let you complete the, I love it too, because it doesn't complete the narrative. Like it doesn't send Neo back out to be Superman. Um, and that's what's so awesome about yeah, it, yeah. right? But it's hard. And I think that movies that do that um, and, and, and art in general that does that, is often seen as difficult or challenging or not fun or lame or yet yeah, go look at every review of the matrix three and you'll see what I'm talking <laughs> about here. Or, well, four actually ends things in its own way. Although, uh, um, never mind, that's a whole paper my grad students writing. You don't need it. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that we could continue on. I, I, I just had to check these yeah. the audience. There are probably questions out there and questions for any of our streamers. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go a little over, but yes, if anyone has a question about this theme or an idea, yes, sir scientific reaction to vaccination, the, the politicization of it. Are you pessimistic, optimistic, let's say five, 10 years from now, Europa, uh, Titan, Enceladus, something comes back, 
what kind of reaction? I guess that's what I was in part what I was coming here for. If I may, I'd like to, to start at least an answer to that. First of all, those are the, my top three destinations. So that's excellent. Um, but I do want to say, and again, I'm like a glass half full person. I actually think that there's been a real boon to science trust as a result of COVID. I think that we see a sort of minority expression very intensely when organized. And again, this goes back to the way that we sort of collect. Um, but I actually, so this is the problem. Um, if we, and uh, if I'm right, that I think that there is maybe more faith in science these days, given the development of these vaccines and their affection or their, their efficacy, um, I still think that it's going to be hard to convince a global lay audience that this crystal thing that behaves in this way is life enough to count. So I'm not sure. I'm excited for the science community and I'm excited for the science interested, like the kids who will see this and then throw themselves into astrobiology in the same way that I threw myself into biology when we cloned a sheep. Like, I don't know what the alternative is, but um, I'm optimistic for the science interested, but I still think it's a huge gap to, to jump for those who aren't initiated in the sciences. And it's a very hard initiation. I don't know if anyone else. <laughs> One of the things the internet did was create a culture of experts who were emboldened by, the, and I would totally lay this at the feet of the Bush administration, that we were post-truth, right? And so one of the difficulties I saw for um, vaccine hesitancy, I don't want to necessarily call it uh, uh, anything worse than that, right, was that in many ways we had worked so hard to convince people that the tools we have are either inscrutable or using the means of, of taking away resources from people. And so people don't necessarily want to believe in them. So like my wife is a nurse. Right. Uh, she's got nine or 10 years experience on the job. She refused to take the vaccine. Right. And I'm like, well, you're a, a nurse at assisted living. You're not an epidemiologist. And so I got kicked out the house for a couple of days. Right. <laughs> and then when she let me back in, she explained that she just felt the science was not it had moved too quickly. Right. And I pointed out to her that this is something that had been worked on for actually 30 years. The woman who came up with it was deeply uh, rejected by the scientific establishment. Right. Until finally, recently that's been proven to do some work. And that did not convince her. And so I think in some ways the Internet plays into this. But there's also a larger American tendency, I think, for anti-intellectualism and doubt yes, right, yes, about sir. about authority. Right. I, I would call it the Illuminati strain. Perhaps. To reference uh, mm -hmm. Sonic, you know. Henry Ross is no respect. There's yes. a whole cultural history of this yes. really worth looking at. It's a cultural history of anti intellectualism in America. Andrew Ross, no respect, anti intellectualism in America. Um, and so this answer has gone on far too long. But I would just, and so this is something that I wanted to say when we were talking earlier. I think the inscrutability of the tools that scientists use has led people to doubt their veracity, validity, and society, so uh, uh, Islam and science fiction and Afro and astrobiology, because apparently Islam was one of the first cultures to start thinking through astrobiology, right? Which is not something you'll necessarily hear on. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Thinking through other cultures and their engagement with what they saw as the heavens or the, the possibilities for living out there, I think gave us something that science has taken from us, right? Science promises certainty, but the scientists always say 90% confidence interval, mm -hmm. right? And it's a term of art, right? Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's also counterintuitive. It's, I think, honestly, and I'm like, I am. I mean, I, I represent a science institute. I'm not going to talk poorly about science. I love it. Um, but I think that the attempt to express the uncertainty of eliminating that black boxiness. But unfortunately, it's like I think that there's this trade off where people want authority, but they also want to know what's happening within the black box. And if we lift the black box up and say, well, to 80 percent confidence, we think this thing will work. Yeah. Well, if it's not 100 percent, then it's at, at some point unreliable and you have to make your So so it's like I don't know. I don't know what to do, but it's like it's, you know, a, an effort towards transparency, I think, would go a long way. And at this point, transparency for that uncertainty might be the solution that I'd propose, but I don't know. We could send you all the technical communication training. All right. <laughs> <laughs> more questions. More questions. Yes, more questions. Any from the um, feed? All right. Any thoughts on the likelihood? Can we, can we get like a poll? Do we think that we'll find aliens in the next 20 years? I think just let's start with aliens and let's let's go from there. So just aliens, dumb or not. All right. Good majority. Well, I think the James Webb telescope may find uh, strong indications of life on exoplanets. Oh, and I want to say, I'm sorry, maybe I am too talking too much. Um, so uh, Frank Drake, who works at SETI, he proposed in the 60s that, uh, you know, this Frank equation that sort of allowed you to formally calculate how many 
intelligent, communicative, technological alien civilizations there are. Of course, at the time, that seemed really crazy. And one of the components in that in that uh, equation is the number of exoplanets. And at the time that he proposed it, there as of today, there are over 5,000 because our technology allows us to see things that we couldn't imagine were possible before. And so, you know, I think that James Webb is an excellent example. If we just kind of broaden our perspective and recognize that we might, we life might be inventive enough to finally develop the technology that allows us to find it. Like we just have to be open-minded to the fact that these possibilities are in fact possible. And so I like that. It's like everyone laughed at, Jay, at Frank Drake, but now we're literally like doing, we're sending missions out to these exoplanets with hope. It's a faith. I'd like to ask the science skeptics why they don't think. Right. Yeah. So we had a ton of fans that said they do. But for those of you out who don't think we'll find alien life, why is that? To find alien life. Uh, well, that that's, that's, <laughs> this is one hypothesis. This is not a definition, but it seems to me that, um, again, I said it's like life makes art. That's like silly, but I think um, alien life might be um, a system ca capable of creating or um, creating sufficiently complex systems that couldn't come to fruition randomly. Silly users. Tool makers, mm -hmm. tool makers and users and memory havers and exploiters. I got a hard no. Yeah. Yeah. Players, not in 20 years. Not 20, 20 years. years. Not in 20 years, but I think bacterial single cell life yeah. Yeah. in 20 yeah. years. Yeah. Oh, but to be fair, I'm, I'm not even talking at the complex level of a bacterial cell. I'm saying like maybe even some primordial DNA. So my alien is even simpler than yours. Do you agree that that might be found in the next 20 years? A DNA that makes tools? DNA is itself a tool. Woo. <laughs> 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 Again, will there be global consensus? Absolutely not. And this is what's so fascinating. Like, how do we, I don't know, continue to engage? Other skeptics. Others who believe in 20 years. How agnostic do you want to go? Uh, I, I heard you, Caitlin, say about uh, uh, doing interesting things with stuff. But I also heard in this panel, uh, physiological changes, uh, how about mental changes? How about idealism as a metaphysics? So like a, a sort of immaterial emerging phenomenon? Something like that? Something like that, yeah. I wonder, just for my part, and this is just an opinion, it seems to me that something like that would necessarily require a material foundation. And I think that that material foundation might be something like a, a, a pre about to be lifeness. So, but I think that that might act, we could call it like an idiosignature or something, but I think that this sort of like phenomenon is something that we should be considering if there's a possibility for us to formalize a way to look for it. Um, because, you know, as we said, it's like every time we think of life, we have, we accidentally imbue consciousness or agency or something like that. And so I wonder if, I wonder if there's a way to seek that as a biosignature elsewhere and then kind of like get even lower down and see what it might be emerging from. If it is in fact emergent, I might be wrong. Right. I, I, I meant, I do mean something like emergence because it might not be emergence at all. There's a, a lively debate in consciousness studies mm -hmm. about uh, you know, idealism versus uh, materialism. Oh, extra, extra. will you point me to some of that literature? I'd be curious to read it. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, here's here's the... I've, I've said to this panel, one of the things that I'd like to do with the show is, as we evolve is I, and I want to, <laughs> uh, I want to talk to this room about it. Um, the spiritual realm, the faith realm and how it impacts how we talk about everything that we've talked about this evening. Um, because I, I know that that is going to, um, as our show evolves and, and the way people look at uh, what may or may not be proof. You guys first, and then the panel. Please. Yeah. Uh, Marissa, I'm an atheist, and so I'm like, okay, it's all wide open. There's life here. Wherever there's water, there could be life. It could be life on your open, no matter what it is. Uh, but my mother was a devout Christian, but even she believed that there could be alien life because there's a passage in the Bible that says other sheep. Well, if God created us, how do you know he didn't create stuff here, there, wherever? Which, I mean, I don't believe in God, but that was her viewpoint. See, I love this. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
I think, unfortunately, for the show itself, it's fighting a losing battle, right? She said it herself. We wouldn't know alien life unless it came up and shot us a la Mars attacks. And I actually believe that's true. And I believe uh, I 100% agree with Caitlin that when we find it, she didn't say this, but I will. It's going to be a non-event because it's going to be something that doesn't look like us. It's going to be DNA or whatever it's going to be. And most of the people probably won't take it as life or care about life. And if you bring in faith, that's, I mean, you're going to have to follow whatever your audience wants, right? Because that's the business that you're in. And the, the, the rub though, is that they're never going to find the spaceship because it's not, because one of the And I think that while there is intelligent life out there, we'll probably never know because they'll die, we'll die, we're too far away from each other, and those bubbles will simply never collide. We're, we're there. Sorry, it's lame, but they're right. And we're here, or vice versa? It could be anything, right? You could, you, could have had, you could have had hundreds of civilizations evolve and die over the course of time, yeah. and we're here for a blip, yeah. those will travel, but they may be passed by the time that they're evolved, and you know, who knows, and, and just yeah. the distance. And, and the they're too thing, far apart. Yeah, yeah. too yeah. far yeah. apart. You know, saying, you can speak of some civilization, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was gonna say, even if they are contemporaries, do they wanna be heard? I mean, that's an argument. That's, that's another argument. That's an argument going on in science today, where, you know, we've sent these messages out, and now we're starting to question whether we should have. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone that can hear us. Yeah. Yeah. See, Clark made that point all the way back in 2001, right? So, yeah, or in the uh, the Sentinel, actually, the even earlier story that we had basically doxed ourselves by doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what is the what is the thing that I, that I read last week or week before that NASA is sending out new pictures or something or? Oh yeah. Am I the only one who read that? No, that's 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 from the 70s. This is the Voyager oh, mission. This is the Voyager. This is the Voyager okay. mission. The joke, I guess, is that like. We would send out nudes in our own address and ask the aliens to try to send the mood and send them to come back with that. Also, well, first of all, it was the 70s and they had just lifted all the porn codes, right? Right. Oh, so that does make sense. But what's funny, especially in this day and age, right, is that we send them a picture of a man and a woman as if we expect them to be, to understand what that means. Right. And it doesn't even really exactly entirely mapped to the way we're in increasingly thinking about humanity. So first of all, it's right, an artifact of, a, a, and that's fine because it was, but it is funny that even then we would have just assumed, well, of course they'll need to know that that we have two sexes or whatever. Like, why? Why? Because it is possible that other life might be trisexual. It might take three genetic strands to make a child. It might be like a right. family kind of situation. Right, right, right. But yeah. I'm not sure that them seeing our two, like, I, I don't know what information that would necessarily impart to a truly alien race. Quite, quite, quite honestly, I think it's total vanity. I think it's like, yeah. there's all this diversity on our planet, but like, these are the things that you should be looking for. And these are sort of like the 70s model of what those things should be. So it was a little short sighted. And of course, by the time they catch up to the aliens that might be out there, who knows if our sun has exploded. Yes, sir. <laughs> spirituality and organized organized religion yes. Yes. Sure. organized religion definitely will have i think there will be a lot of negativity that will go on there but spirituality i don't think there will be much of an impact yeah i know in our show it's 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 interesting because we 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 get a lot of submissions about uh the weeping mary and right and 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 cloud formations that speak to people and I mean, that's speaking to their belief system and faith and spirituality, whatever it is, right? And I I find that that, that material kind of speaks to me if you're asking me what connects with me. Um, you know, and, and that material kind of does. I, I love um, what's realistic and theoretical in these conversations. But again, I'm a kid from Baltimore. A lot of this stuff is flying over way over my head, right? But what, but, but, what I, but what I do want to understand better is how I can connect, you know, uh, particularly people, I'll, I'll be honest about it, people of color who, who for, for much of my life have, have not been connected to this world and this space and these conversations. I mean, it's, it's amazing to have both of us here um, today talking about this. It's, it's 
wild and crazy and kooky that I'm hosting a show that's that's talking about these issues and 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 I'm learning from you guys I'm learning from this panel and and I'm happy to call uh Lisa a friend um who's helping me understand this better so that I can hopefully bring more people who look like me into this space to have these conversations um so this has been wonderful for me what are these shoes that you're wearing what is what is happening here <laughs> so I'm putting those on the screen. I thank all of you for contributing to what I really, really, I think so. And let's have another question. I don't want to like cut anyone off. Yeah, okay, we have one more. So a quick question. Um, sorry, amazing panel. Um, so I'm a prebiotic chemist, so I do the origin of life side of astrobiology. And um, I'm from Australia as well. And in Australia, maybe academia is a bit more conservative, where if I wanted to go on a show like your show, if I wanted to write an article about not even like, you know, exploring what's the science behind a UFO, you know, like how could a UFO get here or how would life fall on another planet? My supervisor would really recommend me not to do it. I'll be shot down. It would be hard for me to get a job in academia. But I'm just wondering, is that something that's experienced in the States? And as people who are like, you know, science adjacent in arts and sci-fi, like how do you work in that space? Yeah. yeah. It's perfectly cool if you're at Georgia Tech. Yeah. <laughs> No, um, it, it would be the same thing here. In part, it has to do with seniority, though, as well. And that's true even at tech, that we would certainly encourage younger faculty or uh, developing um, PhDs and, and younger faculty to maybe not pursue that stuff. I mean, take it if it's offered, but like, yeah, um, publish books with peer-reviewed journal, or, or, yeah, presses and things. Um, but again, I think, you know, this is important and it's something I actually do like about Georgia Tech is they push those of us who are past to develop as public intellectuals. And this is so important. We've been talking today about the difficulty of negotiating a sort of black box science versus a more open science. And I think that, you know, doing public intellectual work and doing things like appearing on shows like Tony's show, being on James Cameron's story of science fiction, talking in the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, like Andre just did, you have to engage and we have to reach each other. If you want to start to get people comfortable with all of these things we're talking about and sort of the next stage of intellectual and social development, like, we, we got to keep talking to each other and not just through stories. Quick question. You said uh, people have to be more comfortable with uncertainty. One of the ways you can think about it is risk to reward ratio. So maybe a better way of making people feel more comfortable is explaining it to them in a way that material gain is possible mm -hmm. for the amount of risk proportional to whatever alien thing could <laughs> your daily lives. I guess I'll just wrap it up with this, and this kind of addresses your question earlier. I think that like science is sort of a, a mediating medium, but I'm sorry for the redundancy, of possibility. Essentially, it's like we can be imaginative and we can think up all the possibilities in the universe, and then we use science to sort of empirically re remove those possibilities from the, the actual. And so like this faithful possibility that God is the you know prime designer that hasn't yet been disproven by science. It remains as viable a possibility as all of the other ones that like whether the, the stuff that you're doing in your lab in Australia. But the fact of the matter is if, if there is an infinity of possibilities, I feel like science makes that finite. And I think that's an extraordinary step forward. And I, so like, it's, it's all, it's, it's, it's almost like art gives science the opportunity to be a little more uh, adjudicating about what could and could not be. But it's like, it's a loop and it's a feedback. You can't do one without the other. That's my show. That's my show. Thank you all for bringing your very exploratory questions, for your open-mindedness to the possibility of alien existence, and thank you three for your expertise on the on the possibility of a human peace or lack thereof when this happens. But I'm I'm hoping for peace. So can we get a round of applause for our panel? Thank you for attending. Have a lovely night.